You are listening to the Gateway Church in Spring Lake, Michigan. To learn more, visit us at thegatewaygh.com. We are finishing today our series that we've been uh, discussing called Discover the Holy Spirit. And it's been incredible, hasn't it, church? I mean, it has been so much fun. And I really had a sense that this is just the beginning. Now we're going to conclude a series, but I believe what we've experienced over the last several weeks and over the last two months, really, I believe is more of the new norm, that we are moving into a new day as a church And that God, he's opening up uh, the doors for us. We've talked about this little diagram. Let's go ahead to that diagram where we live in the natural uh, with human ability, human wisdom, human skill, human awareness. And uh, then there's this natural, like there's a ceiling and we can only go so far as humans. How many understand what I'm talking about? We can only go so far on our own. Then above that is God's ability, which is limitless, right? There's no bounds. Supernatural wisdom, supernatural skill, supernatural awareness. And you say, well, how do we get God's ability down to earth, right? From heaven to earth. The way we do that is through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit breaks through that barrier from heaven down to earth, and he gives us gifts, and we've been talking about those, the nine spiritual gifts, and those things are for you, they're for your family, they're for the body of Christ, the church, and what we're going to learn today, again, is that it's for outside of these four walls, and we don't want to forget this, and again, what we've experienced, what we've been uh, pressing into the presence of God, I believe is not just concluding a series, but it's really, we've set precedents for the future, that we're heading into a new day with new opportunity. Without further ado, I'm going to ask Jason Kohler to come back. He is going to talk about the Holy Spirit and missions. And uh, just hold on. The Lord is going to use him like he did first service. Thanks for being here. We love you, Jason. It's all yours. All right. It is an honor to be here. It's an honor to talk about the Holy Spirit. And man, without the Holy Spirit, we are... In rough shape, we need Jesus. And so let's begin real quick. I know you've uh, been in the series, different parts. I know you, you've looked at, at the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the spiritual gifts. So we're going to try to bring it together. And, and I, I've kind of entitled this, The Holy Spirit in Action. The Holy Spirit in Action in a case study. So hopefully uh, we can get some stuff out of this to go Filled with the Holy Spirit and go and make a difference in the world. So we'll start in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, you guys studied, the day of Pentecost comes. The, the disciples are gathered together in one room and the Spirit comes. So it says, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Man, what a wonderful experience. I would have loved to be there, right? I'm like, man, I wonder what that looks like. And as you think about Pentecost and the day of Pentecost, the day of Pentecost was the full manifestation of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, obviously, was moving in the Old Testament and in the times of the gospel stories with Jesus. But the full manifestation came on the day of Pentecost. Jesus says, it's better if I leave you so that the Holy Spirit can come. So there was something more complete, more full that happened on the day of Pentecost. And it's really interesting there. Side note, Jesus said, it's better that I go. So it's actually better with Holy Spirit with us than physical Jesus walking this earth. Interesting thought. And so the day of Pentecost comes, and and the Spirit is lavishly poured out on them, and they speak in tongues. And tongues is a wonderful and beautiful gift. Uh, I love to pray in tongues. I'm grateful for that. But let me tell you something. Tongues is, is not the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
tongues is, is a benefit, a blessing, and a sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But it's not the purpose. The purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not even for you to overcome sin. It's not to help you pray. It's not to help you worship. These are all benefits and really awesome and great things. But again, it's not the purpose. The purpose, if you go back to chapter 1, verse 8 of the book of Acts, and you will receive power. Jesus tells them, you will receive power when the Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to be Christ's witness in this world. All the other things, all the other benefits of prayer and worship and righteousness and growing closer are wonderful things pushing you to be his witness. And why do we, why do we need to be God's witness? And the simple question of the why, the simple answer to the why is, well, do you look around at the world and see that it looks like Jesus intended? Does the world look like the way that it's supposed to? It doesn't. There is brokenness. There is, is hurt in our own lives, let alone outside of the church. The world needs the presence of Jesus, the love of Jesus that we sang about, the healing of Jesus. And so as we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we are empowered to be his witnesses to a hurting and broken world. Not so we can convert people, or da, 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 but to, bring, to be agents of change, of love, of blessing, of prosperity. And this is why... Paul said in 1 Corinthians, if you guys have been in chapters 12 and 14, if you jump up to chapter 2, uh, he's defending his ministry. Other people were criticizing him, and he actually says, hey, 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 wait a second here. When I came to you, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, he says, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. The people this world doesn't need your wise and persuasive words. It needs a demonstration of the power of God, empowered to be his witness, to see his kingdom and his goodness and his love spread. And when the Spirit of God comes on you, it changes you. And when you try to do it in your own power, it kind of falls short. Look at the disciples. They were kind of doing it in their own power for a while. And, you know, the disciples before Pentecost, they're arguing with each other like, yo, I'm the best. No, I'm the best. You know, who's the best MC, the best disciple here? They were arguing with each other. And <laughs> Jesus is like, you missed the point. Uh, even at the Last Supper, they're arguing who, who is the best. Uh, the night that Jesus is arrested, they run away. <laughs> they run away from Jesus. Peter denies Jesus three times. Then Jesus dies, is resurrected, comes back. But even after the resurrection, in Acts chapter 1, they're, arg they're, they're asking the wrong question of Jesus. They're like, hey, Jesus, when is Israel going to become that political power, like the strongest nation in the world? When, when's the kingdom going to come to Israel? And, and, and Jesus doesn't even answer their question. He comes back and says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you to be my witnesses. And so even then, after the resurrection, they, they were, their thinking was off. But on the day of Pentecost, the power of God falls on them. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. They go out in their streets. Peter, in the same place that, that Jesus was arrested and crucified, stands up and declares to them the message of the gospel. And even really in a pretty sharp way, says, you crucified the Messiah, <laughs> Very bold and courageous. He had been changed by the power of God. We need the Holy Spirit. We need a demonstration. They don't need our wise and persuasive words. They need a demonstration of the power of God. When I was a, a, a college student, I got saved at the University of Michigan as a college student. Go blue. And so I, I was a, a partying, drinking. I was in a fraternity. I was doing my own thing. I got saved. Well, I didn't quite stop all of that all at once, and I kind of stumbled through college trying to figure out what it meant to be a follower of Jesus and came to my senior year. I went to this missions conference, and they challenge you at this missions conference, give a year to missions, pray about a lifetime. I was like, okay, I'll, you know, maybe. 
Um, I was just like, Jesus, if you want to do that, just tell me real clearly. And I was talking to a missionary from Namibia. It's in southern Africa. And it's just something clicked in my heart. It was like, I was like, huh, maybe I should go to Africa. About maybe two hours after that, I went to a breakout session. And in that breakout session, it was about the Holy Spirit, about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I was filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit that day. And it was like a confirmation that Jesus was speaking to me, was leading me to serve in Africa. Now, I didn't have any clue where to go, and the Lord brought me in a process there. But I, I kind of joked that I got Acts chapter 1, go to the nations, and Acts chapter 2, empowerment to do that, all kind of in a few hours of each other. It was a beautiful day, and it transformed my life. I was a pretty insecure uh, college student. You know, if I was around Christians, I would act Christian. If I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't acting Christian. And I was transformed when I was filled with the Holy Spirit. From that, a year later, I was in Kenya serving uh, God there, and he used me to reach gangs. People in these gangs were, were quitting the gang and joining the church. Like, crazy stuff, because I got filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered to be his witness. We need the Holy Spirit. And I serve in Africa. I serve in East Africa with this unreached people group. And, and I love the African church. And the African church is Pentecostal. You know, you go into an African, I've been to some African churches in America, and they're crazy Pentecostal too. Man, they're like doing I've been in churches where we're dancing around the edge of the sanctuary, Jericho marching, uh, everybody's praying in tongues loudly. They don't, you know, it is a Pentecostal church, and they don't make any apologies for that. And in fact, in Africa, most churches are Pentecostal. But there is a divide, uh, and it's not just Africa, but there is a divide of this powerful Pentecostal church, and then Islam. And there is a divide between Islam, usually in the north, and Pentecostal Christianity in the south. And it's like, they don't cross that, they don't, no, that's not our, you know, it's like in Lion King. It's like, every, that's, except for that dark area, we don't go there. <laughs> you know, that's where the hyenas are. If you're not following me, it's okay, I'll move on. And so it's like they just, there's no, it's, there is a, and it's not just Africa, it's, it's Christianity. If you study the history of Christianity, we've stayed away from Islam. It's like we've gone around the Middle East. We've gone to certain places. We've stayed away from where Islam is. And in fact, if you study the history of missions in the church, we have been more prone to fight with them than to fight for them in prayer. We have been more prone to battle them with, with weapons, with swords, with guns, than to tear down strongholds and take battle against those spiritual strongholds. You know, we've, we've gone to Jerusalem, we've gone to Judea, we've gone to Samaria, we've gone to the ends of the earth, but we've left aside Mecca. We've left aside Afghanistan. We've left aside Mogadishu. And, and what happens then, because there has been no proclamation in these areas, we are now bearing the fruit of a lack of proclamation. What happens when, when a place never has an opportunity to experience Pentecost? Violence, terrorism, destruction. We are bearing the fruit of our lack of proclamation. I see terrorism as just the symptom of a deeper spiritual problem. The answer, is, and this, I can get in trouble here, but the answer is not more military might. There are places for that sometimes. The answer is Jesus. The answer is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The answer is people being filled and transformed by the love of God. And so, as I serve amongst the people that I serve, A Pentecostal person. We serve on a team. I serve on a wonderful team. Pentecostal team. We are Pentecostals living in a pre-Pentecost world. In fact, we're living in kind of the Old Testament world at times. And, and so I'll give you an example. The people I work with, they, they believe and they practice in polygamy. Islam allows up to four wives for men, but only one husband for a woman. 
And so the problem is no woman that I've ever met, even amongst no Muslim woman that I've ever met, wants her husband to have other wives. It, it's like in the religion, so they kind of accept it, but they don't like it. So what usually happens is the man goes and does it secretly, or he just openly divorces the woman and goes and starts a new family, leaves those children behind. Or he does it secretly, eventually it comes out, and there's divorce. I would say the divorce rate is at a minimum of 90% in the community that I serve in. And what happens then is you have all these children that are not really being raised by fathers. Uh, it creates a lot of financial problems because the women are not given a ton of financial opportunity uh, to, to make an income. And the men are having so many children that they can't take care of us, so there's a financial problem. But secondly, more importantly, there's an emotional problem because there's not nurturing, caring fathers like God intended into these families, which then perpetuates a system of brokenness that these men grow up and say, this is what a man is. He goes and starts all these families and has his, his worth is in how many children he has. And so in this pre-Pentecost world and culture, it, it, it just spirals out of control in many directions. We are a Pentecostal people living in a pre-Pentecost culture. And so what do we do in these cases? How do we live? And I'm grateful for the Bible because it gives us some examples. And I want to look at some stories, Acts chapter 8, 9, and 10, of the, the church has been filled with the Holy Spirit, but they're now starting to go out. They're st now starting to encounter uh, places that have not, in not been impacted by the Holy Spirit. So they are a Pentecostal people, but in a pre-Pentecost culture. And so there's a pattern here. I'm going to go real quick. I challenge you, if you have time, to go read these three chapters this week. You'll get more details. But I'm just going to summarize them real quick. So a guy named Philip. Philip, uh, he goes to Samaria. Revival breaks out. All these people are getting saved. And then the Holy Spirit tells him, go on the desert road to Gaza. So go out in the desert. As a side note, uh, sometimes... Uh, people have come to me and they say, why don't you just go? My grandma asked me this a few weeks ago even. Why don't you just go where people are more receptive? Because the people aren't very receptive where I'm at. And Why don't you just go where more, you know, you can get more numbers and be more receptive? And I said, two reasons. One, if we only go to the places that are receptive, those places that are not receptive will never have an opportunity to turn to Jesus. And they'll just stay the same, which thus is what happened in many parts of the world. Secondly, obedience. Jesus, I feel like, has told me to work here amongst these people, and I'm just being obedient. If he told me to go to somewhere else, I would go somewhere else. It's an issue of obedience. And so Philip, he tells him to leave the like, powerful church going on here in Samaria, and he goes out. So he had Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. He's starting to go out. And as he goes, he's in the desert. He sees a chariot, and the Holy Spirit says, go up alongside that chariot. He, he runs up beside it, and he hears an Ethiopian man, uh, and, and, and this Ethiopian man is, is reading from a passage of Scripture from the Old Testament prophesying about the death and the atonement of the Messiah. And Philip says, hey, hey, hey. It had to be funny because there's like probably no one else around. So it's pretty obvious that Philip was, a, was, was approaching him. He said, hey, do you know what you're, do you know what you're reading? He says, how, the, the Ethiopian man says, how can I know unless someone explains it to me? So from there, Philip explains the word of God. The man turns to Jesus, is baptized into water. Next story, Saul. Saul uh, is a Jewish priest, is really does not like Christianity. He thinks it's destroying Judaism. At this time, Christianity wasn't viewed as a separate religion, just kind of a, a sect, an offshoot. And so he's going around arresting and persecuting Christians. He's on the road from Jerusalem to Damascus, uh, as he's going, Saul is, is struck by light, falls down, is blinded, and hears a voice that says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, well, who are you? And the voice says, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. Uh, and from there, Saul is blinded. He's led into the city. At the same time, this dude, Ananias, don't know much about him, but he was just chilling one day, has a vision and Jesus speaks to him and says, Ananias, go to this, this street around the corner. My, 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 my guy Saul is there, 
and I want you to go lay hands on him. He's even seen a vision of you laying hands on him, and you're going to pray, and he's going to receive his sight. And Ananias is like, whoa, 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 wait a second. I have heard of this Saul. Uh, it'd be like the example I gave in first service. like, you know, if Osama, Osama bin Laden's alive, it's like, go to Osama bin Laden and lay your hands on him. And he will receive his, he's seen a vision of you coming. I'd be like, uh, what? <laughs> what are you talking about, Jesus? Uh, Ananias is like, hey, isn't that the one that's been persecuting the church? And there's a little conversation, but Ananias goes, he lays hands on Saul, uh, some scales fall off of Saul's eyes, he can see, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Third story, a, a man named Cornelius. Cornelius was not a Jew, he was a Gentile, but he respected Judaism, but he hadn't gone through the rites of becoming a Jew or anything. And, and so there was this divide between Jews and Gentiles. They really didn't talk to each other, didn't deal with each other if they didn't have to. And so uh, the Jews would even see Cornelius as impure. But they respected him because he was a, a righteous man. He gave a lot of money to the poor. And so uh, at this time, one day in the afternoon, Cornelius has a vision. An angel shows up to him and says, hey, send, uh, send some people to Joppa, the city of Joppa, to go get uh, Peter. He's at this specific house. It's really interesting. Uh, and he'll tell you what to do. So these three men, they go off to Joppa. Meanwhile, as they're coming, Peter's on the roof. He's kind of praying. He gets a vision. I'm not going to go into that, but the purpose of the vision was God was showing Peter not to call anything impure, not to call anything impure. And so when these men then, knock, 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 vision goes away, knock, 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 uh, they, they show up. And Peter's like, normally I wouldn't go with you, but God showed me a vision, so I should probably go with you. They come, they journey. It's not a, not a quick journey. They're about a day's journey. They journey. They go to the house of Cornelius. They're all waiting for Peter to show up. Like if an angel says, like, send for this person, you're probably like, oh, I'm pretty anticipating like, what this guy has to say. And Peter comes in there. He doesn't really know what to do. Again, he's not very respectful. He's like, normally I wouldn't come in your house, but God told me to. So he's, he's there. Uh, and he starts sharing about Jesus, but he's not probably, he's not so certain that Jesus is for the Gentiles even, you know? But as he's speaking, he doesn't even finish, the Holy Spirit falls upon them. They're baptized in the Holy Spirit. They start speaking in tongues, and he's like, well, if they've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, we might as well baptize them in water. So all three of these stories, there is a pattern. And there's another story, Aeneas and Dorcas, I'm not going to go into that, uh, but it follows the same pattern if you want to read that story as well. And so in all three of these stories, there's a pattern to a move of God. So in a move of God, there is first, there's a part that only the Holy Spirit can do. I call that revelation. Like there's, there's stuff that only God can do. We can't do. So for example, like Philip didn't make the, the Ethiopian man be, read this scripture at this exact place at the exact time. God orchestrated to put that Ethiopian man in the right place at the right time reading the right scripture. That is revelation. In the story of Saul, like being knocked down, hearing the voice of Jesus, that is revelation. Peter and Cornelius, Cornelius hears a vision from, or has an angel come to him. That is revelation. That's stuff only God can do. And so in any move of God, He's got to do some stuff. He's got to move. This is God orchestrating circumstances in a way that only he can. And so I'll give you an example. First lady in our community we saw become a, a follower of Jesus. We call her Nina. Nina, one day, she, she joins our school. She's a student. We're interacting with her. One day, Nina has a dream. And in this dream, yeah, I love this. This is my favorite picture of Nina. She's, this is, shows her personality pretty accurately. Uh, so one day, uh, Nina has a dream, and in this dream, she sees a woman dancing of her, of her own people group, and she's uncovered, her hair is, is uncovered, and she's dancing with so much joy and so much freedom. So Nina comes up to her and says, why, why, you know, why are you dancing? What, why, why are you so joyful? And she says, oh, these, these two books. And so she, Nina goes over to the two books, and she reads the first book is called the Old Testament, and the second book is called the New Testament. Nina wakes up. What does that mean? 
she comes to our team and she says, have you ever heard of these books, the Old Testament and the New Testament? And from there, they started studying the Bible together. You know, God moves in miraculous ways, and God moves with signs and wonders and miracles sometimes. But here's something about them. They are signposts. They are signs. They are pointers. They're not the point. Miracles point to God. They're the pointer, but they're not the point. And a miracle in itself very rarely brings somebody to Jesus. It's something that God uses, but he, he, he moves in a way that only he can. Another story, I was sitting with a young man studying the Word of God uh, uh, maybe about a month and a half ago now, and we're reading the Bible, and we're reading John 6, which is Jesus is the bread of life, and he's just, after we sit there, he just sat there stunned, and he just kind of kept looking at it, and he's like this, he's like this, he was kind of speechless. He said, this, I've, I've never felt this before. I'm feeling a peace I've never felt before. That is revelation. I can't do that. I can't do that stuff. And in fact, I wasn't, I was not in the best mood that day, to be totally honest. I was like, all right, let's get this meeting over <laughs> with. I'm tired. Uh, and then I'm like, oh, shoot, Jesus, you're doing something. Okay, I better, like, pay attention. So just, you know, missionaries, we have those days too, right? We're like, let's just get this over. Didn't sleep well last night, you know. And we have those days too. And thank God the Holy Spirit is not dependent on me in that case. And so I was like, oh, shoot, I need to get on. I need to get on the <laughs> what's going on here. And so this is God moving in a way. And, and we can't take credit for it. You know, Ananias couldn't be like, yeah, look at what I did with Saul. You see, you know, you know, Paul the apostle, I was the one who prayed for him, you know. Ananias can't do that. He was like, I don't know what happened, man. I was praying one day, and God told me to go to Saul, and I prayed, and then, like, I, yeah, I'm not quite sure what happened there, but it's cool, it's powerful. Anytime the Holy Spirit moves, I'm usually like, whoa, that was crazy. I, I, like, my, I feel so small, and, the whole, and God feels so big. That's revelation. We can't make that stuff up. But revelation is incomplete. Revelation needs to be combined with obedience. There is a part that we have to play. There is a part, don't get me wrong, only God can play. But there is a part for us to play too. God, in his infinite wisdom, chooses to partner with us. Let's look at all these stories. Philip, an Ethiopian eunuch. Without Philip, the Ethiopian eunuch would have sat there confused about what that scripture meant. But God led Philip out into the desert, and he was able to clarify and teach the true meaning of that passage. Saul. It's interesting that Saul had this vision, he's knocked down, but God chose to bring Ananias alongside. And he wasn't healed of his blindness, he wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit, until Ananias came and laid hands on him. Third story, Cornelius. You know, I guess the angel could have said, here's the whole gospel, da -da -da -da, go tell your family, and they, but that's not what happened. Go send for Peter. And they go and get Peter. Peter comes. When Peter starts preaching the, the word, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. God chooses to work with us, to partner with us. And so with even Nina's story, Nina didn't come to Christ with, after that, that vision, after that dream of the Old Testament, New Testament, but it opened her up to studying the Bible. And after a number of months, Nina came to Jesus. It was a revelation partnered with our obedience in her life. And all of these stories, without Philip and Ananias and Peter, there would be no story. God wants to partner with us. And how does this work? There's really two simple parts to our obedience factor here. One is abiding. We've got to be close enough to hear God, right? Ananias, Philip, Peter, they all heard God speak to them which means they were in relationship with God. They were abiding in Christ, which means they were just close to Jesus. we got to be close enough to hear Jesus. I think we got to turn off our phones sometimes. I've been big at just airplane mode sometimes. That's my new thing. And just, just pull away 
and be close to Jesus. I got to be close enough to Jesus to hear him if I want to be used by him. And so as we're close enough, then obedience. We have to just be faithful to do what he says. He's going to guide and lead us all in different ways and directions. But we have obedience to his direction as we abide. We got to, you know, Peter's on the roof, so to speak, right? We got to get off the roof. Philip's in Samaria. We got to go into the desert. We got to obey him. But here's the thing. When he speaks to us, when he guides us, he doesn't give us all the information, right? It's not like Philip had no clue why he was going out to the desert. He had no clue. Like, Ananias is like, okay, God, you're telling me to go to Saul's house, but I'm not quite sure how this is going to work out. Peter, again, was like, I would never normally do this, but I'm going to do it. They didn't know the revelation that had already happened. They didn't know that the revelation was already occurring. But what if we acted as if God was already speaking to people? What if, we, what if we lived our lives in a way believing that God's already at work at that person? I just got to find, find out. In fact, Ecclesiastes says eternity is in everyone's heart. A desire for God is in everyone, even the most radical Islamic terrorist. One of my God goals is to see a terrorist come to Jesus. <laughs> like, because God is working on everyone's heart. Uh, and so I just, I just tell our team, I said, we just got to go find how God's working in their lives. They don't see it. They're veiled. The gospel is veiled to them. And then we just got to point to them in the right direction, that that's Jesus through love, through faith, like we talked about earlier. And so often, a prayer of mine that I often pray is, God, what are you up to? What are you up to, God? I need to come alongside what you're up to as we partner together. And so... I believe he's already working in the lives of so many people. I, I kind of view it as like we're spiritual detectives, and I just got to do the spiritual detective work to see. So to give you a, a real practical example, if someone is like, like pro, crazy pro environmental, global warming, and whether you believe, whatever you believe on that, there's a, I can point that to Jesus real quick. Who created this earth? And we are to be stewards of this earth. So their desire to treat and take care of the earth is a beautiful thing. And I can use that to steer them towards Jesus. Does that make sense? You, that God is working on people's hearts. We just got to be that detective and then partner with the Holy Spirit to point them in the right direction. And so as a case study of this, I'll, I'll share what God has been doing. So Nina came to Christ. Nina uh, was the first person in our community to come and, and make a decision to follow Jesus. But it's only Nina. <laughs> there's not really other Christians out there. There's some for the people group, but they're scattered, and there's a lot of struggles. And so one day, Nina comes. She's like, I want, like, I, I see these things on the Internet. I want to meet with other Christians and have a church. And, and it's a desire. It's, it's from God to have community and fellowship with my own people. And we're like, well, <laughs> there's not a lot of your own people uh, that are following Jesus. And we, we don't want you to integrate into the, like the, the Kenyan church that is local because it's a different culture. It's a different expression. We want an authentic expression of your culture uh, we don't want to just dissolve into, we want to have an indigenous, indigenous church. That's the word we use. And so we said, hey, what about this? What if us as a team, a couple of us and you, we just start meeting together and we start a church? I always called it a church. It wasn't a fellowship. It wasn't a small group. We are going to be a church. And that was by faith. <laughs> that was by faith. Uh, and so she's like, okay, let's do that. So we worked with her to find out an authentic way. Things are, it's a little different what, what we think of church, but we do it in the local language. I would teach in the local language a lot of times, and over time we empowered her to teach. And uh, we said, you know, at first it kind of felt like we were playing church. Like, it's just one of you, or this is a church, you know. But it was a step of faith. And so we, we did that for, for about a year. And, and I told her when we started, I said, hey, we're, we're doing this, it's just you, I know it's hard, but we're believing that God is bringing the others. In fact, they're on their way. <laughs> they're on their way, we're just getting it ready for them when they come. 
And, and over that, the next couple of years, God started to do something. My friend Alan, who became my, my closest local friend, uh, my language teacher, just a, a, a wonderful man, one of those two. And uh, one day, Alan and I, were sharing a lot with him. He's, he's curious. He's, he's liking the stories. He's, he's being drawn, you can tell. One day, Alan, we're just him and I are walking down the street. We're talking in a local language. And he's like, yeah, I had this dream. I haven't told anybody. I want to tell you about this dream. And again, God is using dreams among Muslims because they believe that God speaks through dreams. And so, uh, and it's interesting. You see some other miracles, but they believe that um, the Quran and reciting that can heal someone. So if we pray in Jesus' name for someone to be healed, they're like, okay, and that God uses that. But they say, well, Islam has that too to them. So it's interesting. Dreams is a huge way that, that God moves miraculously. So we're walking down the street. He's like, yeah, in this dream, me and a religious leader, a Muslim Islamic religious leader, we're walking down the street. He has a Quran under his arm, old man. And, one day, and, and, and all of a sudden, a demon comes out of the ditch and starts attacking us. And so the old man, they believe that the Quran has power to uh, cast demons out. And he starts reciting in Arabic the Quran over the demon. Well, the demon just starts attacking them more and more and more. So they just say, okay, we got to get out of here. They start running. They're running for their lives. This demon's attacking them. And all of a sudden, Alan just stops and he yells out, Jesus! And so he tells me this. I was like, oh, okay, sweet. Uh, all right, what happened next? He's like, and then Jesus flew down from heaven, tied up the demon, and flew back up to heaven. And I woke up. I was like, okay. <laughs> and so I was like, all right. I was like, Alan, what do you think that means? I wanted to hear it from himself. He said, well, I'm not sure. What do you think it means? I said, okay. You know what it means. Like, come on. And I said, okay, well, did the, did the Quran have power over the demon? He's like, oh, no, no. What had power over the demon? Jesus. Oh, interesting. We just kept walking on our way. <laughs> well, shortly after that, maybe a couple months after that, kept reaching out, so I kept pouring into him. Uh, I stood in a pool. And we baptized Alan as he confessed Jesus as his Lord. Same day, we baptized another man, Alex. So now we've gone from one to three. Uh, that's, you know, that's church growth. <laughs> it's a different, you know, but we're talking about an area where there hasn't been any existing church. Uh, Alex brings his friend. His, his friend starts studying the Bible. God starts revealing himself. We're walking along in a relationship. His friend comes to Christ. Then I, I meet another man uh, just one day randomly, uh, and I'm talking to him. And I, uh, my Holy Spirit discernment, the spiritual gift of discernment, right? Discernment of spirits starts. It's hard to describe, but I, I was like, there's something different about this man. I'd never done this before, but I was like, are you Muslim? Because I was thinking he might be a Christian. And... Uh, He's like, no, 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 I'm a Christian. I was like, oh, I'm like, I'm like well, just let me just, are you of this people group? Because I just wanted to confirm, because they can look like others sometimes. He's like, yeah, yeah, I am. I was like, oh, wow. And so I started meeting with him, discipling him. Took, went through a process of joining the church because you got to be careful because there will be fakers who try to infiltrate the church to expose Christians. Uh, and then um, that's how people get killed and chased out of communities. So you got to be careful uh, but this is uh, us and some of the, the believers in our community on Easter. And this is, for all of them except for Nina, their first Easter they've ever celebrated. And they're like, well, what, what are our traditions? I was like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> this is our first Easter. They're like, we have Western traditions, but that's not your traditions. So they're like, oh, we have to create our own traditions. I'm like, great, let's do that. Uh, so it's just crazy stuff as the Holy Spirit starts moving. And so two of these men, uh, one not in this picture, one in this picture, two of these men even came to me one day and they said, we feel called to be pastors to our people. And I was like, whoa, okay, great. So I wasn't quite sure what to do, and that happens a lot of times. That's why you need the Holy Spirit to guide you and great leaders to help you. And so we started sitting down together, and I was teaching a hermeneutics class with them. Hermeneutics is like, how, you know, how to study the scripture. 
And then we did a New Testament survey class. These are pastoral training classes. So I'm leading pastoral training classes for these two young men. One of them, we have never heard, really. We don't, we're not sure of anybody being baptized in the Holy Spirit from this people group. One day, um, I was praying with Alan, and Alan got, like, radically baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he was like, he's like, Holy Spirit. And this is all in, in, in the language, but it's like, Holy Spirit. He didn't have words for it. He's like, in my blood. Uh, it's cold. <laughs> I was like, okay, did anything happen with your mouth? He's like, funny words. <laughs> funny words came out of my mouth. <laughs> it's like, oh, I was like, dang, that's awesome. <laughs> so God is moving. And so we have this church, and, it's, and, they, and, and this people group has had civil war for about 30 years, tribal violence. But these guys are different tribes, and they love the heck out of each other. They cheer each other on. They like, I'm just like, this is Jesus. There's a unity amongst them. And recently, I was kind of pastoring the church, uh, leading it. And as I got ready to step away, I've been back for a month, we decided as a team to hand over leadership to them. And so I handed over leadership to them about a month ago, May 25th, and uh, empowered them. We set up a structure for them to lead the church meeting themselves. It's a house church meeting. Our vision is that we see multiple house churches planted, uh, kind of like if you know anything about the church in China, underground house church planting movement. And so we, we empowered them. We still have oversight. We still have accountability. We still have a relationship, but we're not attending their church meetings anymore, which is pretty awesome. That's our goal, to work ourselves out of a job. And so there's been revelation partnered with obedience, which equals a move of God. And so, as I close here, I have this traditional cup. And in this cup, they will drink camel milk tea, usually. And I love camel milk tea. It's, it's way more nutritious than cow milk, actually, if you have camel milk. And they'll drink this. And as we look at this cup, and I'm going to give this to your church as a gift... There is a cup that is held out for this people. It's a cup of God's love and his mercy and his spirit that he wants to pour on the people. But right now they're embracing a different cup. Islam has distorted their view. And they have, right now, there is a cup of God's wrath and judgment waiting for them if they do not turn and repent by the end of their lives. And, and it, wherever you put this, if you put it somewhere in your church, I, I just pray that you'd look at it and pray for the unreached. That the unreached peoples of the world would exchange a cup of God's wrath for a cup of his mercy poured out for them. And his spirit poured out. They are pre Pentecost people. And 99.99% of them are living in that pre-Pentecost world. And what do you do? What do you do when you are a Pentecost person living in a pre-Pentecost culture? And maybe you've been obedient, but you haven't found your Ethiopian eunuch out there, or you went to the place you thought, like, oh shoot, Saul's not here. That can happen. Sometimes we are obedient to God, and it our Pentecost hasn't come. Maybe you got a family member that you have been praying for, a son or a daughter, a brother or sister, and you just haven't seen the answers to your prayer yet. Maybe in your workplace, you're just discouraged at what you're seeing. You're believing for Pentecost, but it hasn't come yet. Well, the Bible says there's about 120 people on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 1. But 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that Jesus, Jesus appeared to at least 500 people when he was resurrected. So there's a gap there of at least 380. What happened to those 380? I don't know. It doesn't tell us. But I, I know they weren't there. They left before Pentecost came. And so my encouragement is to keep believing. Keep praying keep asking for the Holy Spirit to be poured out. And our team, we're keeping on going. We're, this, we've seen amazing things. 
but this is just the beginning. In fact, our greatest need, Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. Our greatest need is people. We are so grateful for the money that's generously given, but we need people to come and labor with us. If God's put missions on your heart, come and talk to me. I'd love to talk to you. Because we're still believing that there's a greater Pentecost coming. We ain't giving up. In the message version, John chapter 1, it says, Jesus became a man and moved into the neighborhood. We're moving into the neighborhood until we see a full manifestation, a full Pentecost. So in your life, if there's been something you're crying out for, that you're holding on for, my encouragement is keep seeking the Holy Spirit's empowerment. Keep living incarnationally. Keep searching for your Ethiopian eunuchs out there. Keep believing that there are souls that God is already working on. Keep pleading for more Corneliuses that God is going to reveal himself to. Because let me tell you, Pentecost is coming. But are we going to be close enough to God when he calls, when he moves, and obedient when he does? Let me pray for us. Jesus, I pray for the Gateway Church. Oh, Holy Spirit, come. We need you. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with Pentecostal power to go out into a a pre-Pentecost world to share your love. Oh, Oh, Lord, we pray for revelation. We pray revelation over our friends, over our families, God, over our cities. We pray for revelation over our state over our country. We pray for revelation over the world, for the unreached parts of this world. We pray for revelation. And God, I pray that we would be obedient, that we would abide and stay close to you, hear you when you guide and direct us, and obey you and be faithful when you do. Lord, we pray for more, more of you in this world. Pray that you'd reach the Ethiopian eunuchs and the Saul's, reach those that are far from you, reach those that we're not even believing for. Peter wasn't even believing for Cornelius. But God, we believe for those even that we haven't had faith for. Jesus, ultimately, it's about you. It's about your revelation. So come in this world, we pray. We pray for breakthrough. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Can we stand and respond this morning? I know our time has expired, but I don't believe that the Lord is quite finished with us yet. Jason talked about two things, revelation and obedience. You put those together, and it's destiny. There's a move of God. This morning, we have heard through the word of God, through the foolishness of preaching, the Bible says, revelation knowledge has been transferred from heaven to earth into our hearts. And now what I believe the Lord is doing is he's calling us to be obedient. He's calling us to a new norm. He's filling us But now we have to step out and say, okay, I'm going to take the next step. I'm going to be obedient and just believe that those supernatural connections will happen. What I'd like you to do, if you're saying, man, I'm hungry for a move of God in my life, I'm going to ask you to just step out into the aisles and maybe even come forward. And we're going to move back into the song just briefly here. And we're just, But by stepping out, you're saying, God, I want to be obedient. I want to take that first step here where it's safe so I can be used outside of these four walls. And so as we continue, just for a moment here, I pray that the Lord, as you move, that God will just empower you for the next step. Amen? Amen. Let's do that. Father, I pray right now that you would move in this place. Continue to touch our hearts in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 
I believe that the Holy Spirit is pouring himself out on each of us, preparing us for what's next. He's creating divine appointments and he's calling us to be obedient, to step into those and to use our voice, to be a witness, to make a difference. There are people in all of our lives that need to know the love of Jesus. And I believe that the Lord, he's creating opportunity for you to be used. Young and old, I don't care who you are this morning, God is has captured your heart, I believe. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing here. Lord, you've created a new norm. We're not going back to the way things were. Lord, we desire your spirit to be at work within us. Reveal yourself, God, and help us, Lord, to be obedient. And Lord, I pray for a move of God like we've never seen here at the Gateway Church, across West Michigan, to the ends of the earth. Lord, do what only you can do. Father, we're hungry for all that you have. for migraines at all. Um, I feel like the Lord wants to touch somebody. So if that's if that's you, I don't know, just put a hand up. Anybody with migraines? Okay, if you're, let's see, one at least. If that's you, just keep your hand up high, and if you're around that person, just, just lay a hand. Yeah. Amen. I'll just speak a, a quick prayer. Jesus, you are powerful. Powerful Jesus. And so we just pray the blood of Jesus over these minds. Pray that the migraine, we just speak to it, be gone in the name of Jesus. Be healed by the stripes and by the blood of Jesus Christ. All pain, all discomfort be gone from this day forward for your glory and honor, Jesus. Jason, all three stories that he shared in Acts chapter 8, 9, and 10 happened outside of a temple, outside of uh, a church setting. And we are about to head out of these doors outside of a church setting. And the Holy Spirit, the presence that we feel, goes with us and divine appointments come listening and we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And so this is what I'd like you to do just real quick. I want you just to turn and just find someone, maybe, uh, you know, put your hand on their shoulder, or, uh, kind of side hug them or uh, however you want to do that. And let's just pray for the people around us and just, you know, let's just do that all across this place. And uh, yeah, let's, let's just, let's just pray for our friends that were standing around. Lord, we ask that you would prepare us 
for what's next. Help us to walk in confidence. Lord, we pray that you continue to reveal yourself. And God, I just pray that your Holy Spirit will uh, just spur us on. And God, give us an obedience like we've never seen. Uh, the word of the Lord from this morning, first service, was that the time is now. That you've been wondering and you've been waiting. And, and uh, the, the Lord is answering your question when the answer is now. It's now to step up, now to make a difference, now to, to speak. And uh, I just declare that again, this service. And God, I just pray that you would just strengthen us for the task at hand. And Lord, we thank you for this. And God, we give you the glory and all the praise. And Lord, now I pray that as we leave here, that you would go before us, behind us, and all around us. We pray it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. God bless you. Go in the grace of God. Turn and greet someone as you leave and have a wonderful week. We'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to this week's message from the Gateway Church. If you'd like to find out more about our church, such as service times, giving, and ways to get connected, visit us at thegatewaygh.com.